Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode five of the Hockey Coach Podcast. I'm Kevin Muller, and I'm here today with Matt Corthius. You can follow Matt online and social media at Hockey Pro Training. You can follow me online at Kevin M2 Hockey. So today's episode, we are going to be doing Q&A all sessions. So this is kind of fun. It keeps us on our toes, gives us a chance to answer questions that you guys have sent in through social media and through HockeyShare.com slash questions, where you can always submit questions for our Q&A portions. Uh, but we're going to have a little fun with this today. So, uh, Matt, how are we doing? And, uh, you know, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you kick off with the first question here. Sounds good, buddy. What's going on guys? Pumped to be back for another episode. Uh, we got a bunch of good questions queued up here. And as long as these questions have nothing to do with, um, setting up Skype or Ecamm recordings, we should be good to go. Cause we had a couple technical difficulties, um, this morning, but Hey, that's kind of part of life. That's kind of part of, uh, figuring things out as we go. So that's what we're going to do with these questions. We got a few good ones. And let's get right into it. So the first one comes to us, as always, from the Instagram. And this question was a good one. And it was, I've been training every day for hockey because I want to go far in life with hockey. And people are saying to me that I'm too small, I'll never make it, and I'll never be able to do anything with hockey. Do you have any tips on how to deal with the haters and the naysayers? (laughs) Kevin, you want to tackle? One. I guess I can tackle. Yeah. I can tackle this one first, just because I already answered him um, on the Instagram. So, basically, what I said, and if you look at the game today, the game has changed a lot from five to ten years ago, right? Maybe t- five to fifteen years ago, when it was like an Eric Lindros era, where every hockey player, especially forwards, had to be six four, two ten, strong, be able to skate, fight, check all those things. If you looked at like a team like the Leafs or whoever back in the day, they were all big, strong, physical teams with guys who can skate. But nowadays, 2017, the game's gotten a lot quicker, a lot more skilled. You don't see a lot of those guys hanging around anymore, the guys that can only check or fight or can't do the whole, they don't have the whole package, right? So I think the game has never been more accept, uh, ready for guys who are five, six, five, seven. It can just buzz around, create havoc, and just make things happen out there. I gave him the perfect example of Johnny Hockey, uh, I saw him on a podcast the other day on a video, a little clip, and he is not a big man. Like he's got to be five seven, five eight, and he's dominating out there, right? Sidney Crosby's not a huge guy. It's not. It's not the game it used to be. So, I think if you want to play hockey and you want to make something out of it, I wouldn't uh, let your size hold you back at this point of the game. Uh, one hundred percent agree. I would actually take and kind of flip the question a little bit and tackle a different portion of it and say. Why do you care what other people say about it, right? I think you. I think in order to be successful, whether we're talking about hockey here, whether we're talking about business or anything else, you have to kind of just go with your gut and go with what you know is right, and not not let what other people are telling you you can and can't do get to you because mm-hmm. you're spot on. Size is not necessarily the end all be all anymore in this game. This has turned into a skill game. So the question to me becomes actually, um, in terms of the hockey side of it, what are you going to bring to the table that's unique? Right. At your size. So if you're five, seven, five, eight. Great. What's your what's your unique attribute? Right. What's your identity as the hockey player? What's your what's your role on the ice? How are you going to how are you going to contribute? Right. There's only so many people that can contribute like, you know, a Patty Kane can. Um, You know, he's obviously got a very unique skill, but he embraces that skill and he embraces that identity. And I, I don't think it's any different in this case. If you're you know, if the answer is you're you're a smaller player and your hands are unreal. Awesome. If the answer is you're a smaller player and your shots unreal, great. Figure out how to improve it. Figure out how to get to the areas where you can use your shot more. Right. If, you know, I, I know guys who are five, eight that, uh, you know, uh, play a checking role and that's okay. Like just figure out how to do that and how to do it to the best of your ability. And, you know, there's, uh, there's plenty of players that aren't six foot that are that are making progress this year and you know use that use what people say negative towards you as motivation right use it as just another reason that you're going to go out and you're going to you're going to achieve what you're set out to to achieve and you know at the same time don't kid yourself if you're not putting in the full amount of work then understand that uh, in that case the the naysayers may be right so it's a it's, it's a good little self accountability thing there to take that negativity apply it towards your own personal accountability and and just be the best you can be don't worry what other people are telling you um you know go go do this for you yeah well said i think that in anything in life everyone has their their limits right some people aren't going to be fast some people aren't going to be strong some people aren't going to be tall everybody has some type of a limit that's holding them back so 
I don't think you can use size as that excuse anymore. Even look back 20 years to a guy like Thurn Flurry, who was like five foot four. Like, if there's one guy out there that can do it, that just shows that you can do it. It's possible, right? So use guys like that as motivation and don't let these little tiny things hold you back. Keep going, keep grinding, and just see see where it takes you. And like, if the NHL is not your end goal, think of leagues about like Europe. There's leagues all over the world that are even more skill based than the NHL. Like. It's not so size skill based, right? If you look at a few leagues like, I don't know, the Swiss League or Sweden, stuff like that, there's a lot of skilled players over there that probably could play in the NHL. They just maybe weren't big enough to crack some of those teams' lineups at the time. So don't just let the NHL be your be all, end all goal. Yes, it's nice to shoot for that, but there's so many ways to make money playing hockey professionally that if you're not big enough to crack the NHL, sometimes you're just not, right? I know a lot of guys that they had the skill, they had the will, they had the drive. But at the end of the day, if you do end up being like five two, five three, it's going to be difficult for you, right? Let's just yeah, be honest. But again, this, this goes back to this is bigger than bigger than hockey, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and, and he touched on it in his question. He, he said, you know, "I want to be successful in life," right? So, this goes back to these attributes that you're going to take forward and you're going to take and apply into hockey right now will serve you well in business, will serve you well in life. Don't worry. Like hockey's not the end all be mm-hmm. all here. Hockey's great. Hockey's an it's a it's a beautiful sport. It's amazing. It will teach you a lot about yourself. It'll teach you a lot about life. But use it as the platform. Don't use it as your end result every time. Exactly. And also realize that no matter what point of your life you're in, you're always going to deal with some type of haters, some type of negative feedback. It's just it's part of life. You have to learn how to roll with those punches and just keep going. Right. It never stops. It never ends. I'm sure Kevin deals with it on a weekly, monthly basis. There's still people that are going to want to bring you down. They're going to want to, just because they're not doing it, they're going to say that you can't do it. It's just kind of how life goes. It's how people are. And like I said in my Instagram post yesterday, losers want other people to lose, right? So if there's another small guy out there who thinks that you can't do it or thinks he can't do it, he's going to project his feelings onto you, right? He thinks I'm too small. I don't want to put in the extra work to be the next, get to that next step. So neither can you, right? So... That's how people are, so just use that as motivation, as Kevin said, and uh, just keep going. Don't let size be the be-all, end-all factor in where you take your hockey career. Do you have anything else to add to that one, buddy? No, I think we uh, I think we hit that one from all angles, which is always what we try to do here, right, is give not just the hockey-specific mm-hmm. perspective on it, but also the life and the bigger picture perspective. And as I stated, there's never been a better time to be a 5'7", 5'8", 5'9", forward defenseman whatever it may be there's defensemen in the league that are tiny as well but their skills and their will make them more valuable to their team than someone who's 6'4 and doesn't have those skills or the will so never been a better time guys if this was 10 15 years ago and you were 5'6 you'd have no chance you would have no chance right it would be very difficult i would never say no chance but the game's changing luckily for you guys fighting's basically out of the game they're not looking for goons guys are looking for skill right i'm sure the scouting Um, charts have changed as well. What scouts are looking for 10, 15 years ago is not the same as what they're looking for today. It just isn't. So don't let these excuses into motivations. Exactly. All right, let's hammer the next one here. We're going to get a little more technical on this one. It says, hello, I was wondering if you could help me out next year. I'm playing at Weber state in Utah and they plan on Olympic ice. And I really want to work on my gap control since I'm a D man. I skate almost three times a week at 6 a.m. Good for you, getting out there, getting after it. So there's not many people out there, and I don't have anyone to try and work with, and I was wondering if there's anything you know I could do to work on my gap control by myself. So basically, he's a defenseman. He's moving to the bigger ice surface, and he wants to know how to work on that gap control basically by himself, right? He's out there by himself. He's got no teammates to work with. And um, Kevin, you being the uh, tactical wizard that you are, I'm going to let you jump on this one first, and uh, hopefully I can piggyback on some of your answers. Perfect. I think with <laughs> gap control, you have to just dissect what the actual tactic is, and the tactic has a ton to do with your ability to control your speed, adjust your speed, and then move laterally right, and make those adjustments. So on the big surface, you're dealing with about 7.5 extra feet on both sides of the ice, so a total of 15 extra feet. So that's – you know. That's an extra body length you have to cover, essentially. Um, you know, so number one is I'm going to say break down the skating habits. Uh, you can never be too good uh, moving laterally. You can you can continue to work in that. You don't need anybody else there, right? You can work on getting up ice, hitting a hard pivot, 
coming backwards and then stepping out and making the pin, making the angle, right? Going through the, the, the body mechanics of, of those uh, different scenarios as you, as you attack the wall. It's, um, you know, and it's also one of those things where you have to be comfortable to hitting that quick start off the, off the offensive blue line and you have to be comfortable adjusting your speed. So I would look at it, um, you know, from a, I guess from the skill standpoint, I look at it and I break it down and I say, what skating elements are present in the tactic that we're looking at? And there's, there, there's a, there's a lot you can work on there. Yeah. Good answer. And I'm, I'm going to add a couple things to this. Um, first of all, is what you could do is you could watch some of the more elite NHL defensemen and really break down their gap control, right? Watch a game, slow it down, hit the slow-mo and just check out their movement patterns and what they're doing either in the neutral zone where they're, they're backing off the line in the offensive zone and just mimic those patterns. You can go out there by yourself and maybe you write down four different ideas, right? The first one's going to be that first couple steps back, the quick start, the quick step, whatever you want to call it. The next is going to be kind of finding your guy and gapping up on him. You can visualize these things. You don't need that player in front of you. You've played long enough. If you're playing at that level, you have an idea of where that forward's going to be and where you're going to be. So like Kevin said, work on those skating skills and what it's going to involve doing um, come game time. And second, um, I remember myself when I first got to Europe, I played in a really small bar. When I, when I played junior, I played in Estevan. And if anybody is from that area um, and they remember the Estevan barn 10, 5, 10 years ago, it was tiny. It was a barn. I'm not sure what the exact size was, but it's the smallest rink I've ever played in. I could play in the game all day. I'd never have to come off. Like It was just that small. And it was a physical game. So when I got to Europe, I played in one of the biggest rinks there was there. It was huge. Once again, I'm not sure the exact dimensions, but it was massive. And for me, I found conditioning to be a big factor in uh, how I felt out there. There was a lot more skating, a lot more back checking, a lot more just that time you're spending um, regrouping, adjusting, opening up, following the puck, tracking the puck. It was just a lot more skating, even the time it took to change, right? So make sure you got that conditioning ready because it's going to be a different game when you're going back to get that puck, when you're rushing the puck up ice. Those few extra strides that you're not used to, you're going to notice a difference. So make sure that conditioning is ready to go. Make sure you got those skating patterns down pat. And you should be good to go. And hopefully you can get a jump on the guys who didn't do those things in their off-season training. Right. And you, you hit the nail on the head with the word pattern because that's what hockey is. Hockey is a game of patterns. So if you can recognize a pattern quicker than the next player, you have better hockey IQ. You have better ability to execute uh, when you're in that scenario. And again, take this then. Identify a pattern that you see, piggybacking off what Matt said about identifying on video. Look for the pattern. Look for the habits. And then go to execute it on your own. You don't need the other players on the ice to mm -hmm. do that. And you can even bring your phone out, videotape that exact pattern, look at it, then go through it, look at it, go through it. You could put your phone on the ice, videotape yourself, look at your pattern, and then break yourself down. I found that that's something that's been super valuable for me, um, even going back and editing a lot of the videos that I post. Man, is there a lot of errors in the stuff I do? You know what I mean? That video yeah. does not lie. It doesn't lie. Even watching these podcasts back, you can just see, oh, I did that, oh, I did that. So don't be afraid to put your phone down. It's easy to get a quick clip. It doesn't have to be perfect. And just see, am I doing the clip like he is? What can I improve on? Do my feet need to get quicker? Does my Am I crossing over too much? Whatever it may be, right? So don't be afraid to use video. Don't be afraid to uh, study the game a little bit. I think the more the game evolves, the more the game needs to be studied and analyzed, not only as coaches, but as players as well. And something I've only recently gotten into as a coach, but something I never did as a player. So like we always try to do here is just try to use the things we didn't do. We're going to try to give back to you guys so you guys can add them to your game. And I think the best are always studying the best. And if you want to be the best, you got to start training like the best. So anything else to add to that one? Yeah, I think uh, this comes from actually something that happened on uh, Friday of this week is, you know, uh, I was actually working with a kid one-on-one -on -one and we filmed him doing a skill that I'm, I am pretty proficient in, right. In terms of my own personal execution, but we filmed it, we put them side by side. And it's funny, like even that simple skill it was a basic transition that we were working on, like a, like a defense turn. Right. And, you know, I, I picked out two, three things that I need to do better when I actually execute it. So that, that, Ability to get that instant visual feedback is just absolutely critical. And mm -hmm. if you can do it, even on a skill that you think you're proficient at, I guarantee you, if you look at it with the right eye, you can probably find two or three, two or three things to tweak in there. And it's amazing how 
when you do something and you think you've done it really well, like you said, I've, I know exactly what you're talking, what you're thinking. I'm hitting it all. I'm doing it all. This is exactly how it's supposed to be done. The video comes out and you're not even close. It's it just is what it is, right? You got to... You got to fine tune these things, and I think the video will help you do that. It's not about perfection; it's just about fine tuning and um, getting yourself to the place you want to be at. So, a couple of good points there. I think that should be helpful. Just find a way. At the end of the day, you got to find a way. Being out there by yourself is not an excuse. Um, I know you're not using it as one, but I'm just saying you got to find a way to um, just get after it. All righty, we're going to move on to the next question of the day. And this is going to be from Instagram once again. And it says, I'm trying to get into good nutritional habits. I'm 15 years old and just want to know the best advice you can give me on how to become more healthy on a day-to-day basis and how to get started. <laughs> Maddie, this seems like this is right up your wheelhouse. So I'm going to let yeah. you take first swing at this one. So I love these kind of questions. Um, I, I started my health journey maybe five, six years ago, um, due to some health issues I was having and realized that, um, coming up to that point in my life, I never really thought too much about what I was putting in my body. I actually never thought about it. Never. I was 27 years old. I played professional hockey for seven years at that point. Never thought about it. I just ate, drank whatever I wanted, felt okay until I didn't. Right. And then I knew there was time to make some changes. And I read a book called Thrive by a guy named Brendan Brazier and kind of his philosophy was to crowd out the bad by adding in the good, right? So instead of focusing on all the things you can't eat and all the things you shouldn't eat and all the things that are quote unquote bad for you, his focus was adding in more of the good and then over time, you're going to start just to eliminate those things just because you don't feel like eating them anymore. So my advice is always just to start adding in more of the good. Add in more fresh fruits and vegetables. Start your day with water instead of going just for the coffee or the Red Bull. Start your day with a green smoothie, whatever it is. Just kind of add in more good. And over time, you're going to notice that the healthier you eat, as soon as you start putting that bad stuff and that garbage into your body, you're going to get that instant feedback from your body, right? And it's not going to feel good. And you're going to be like, okay, you know now, uh, maybe I shouldn't have that. Maybe I'll stick with whatever it is, right? So... Just try to add in more good and just try to keep out as much bad as you possible. And by good, I think there's a million different dietary philosophies out there. And I'm not going to sit here and break down my own for four hours. But I think we can all agree that adding in more fresh fruits and vegetables is going to be beneficial for your body. So my my number one advice, my tactical advice and something I've been doing for years, start your day with some fruit, start your day with some water, get off to that good start, make a smoothie, and then go from there, right? So... What I try to do is I try to start with breakfast, nail that every single day. There's nothing going wrong there. Then you can move on to lunch. Then you can move on to dinner and just try to make your day as healthy as you possibly can. It's not about being perfect like the other topics, but just starting off fresh, you can't really go wrong with that. Yeah, that's good advice. And I think uh, my advice kind of is right along the same lines of it. I would say in terms of um, you know something you can actually tangibly do, is start by writing down everything you eat, everything you put in your body, whether you grab, you know, um, a, a Red Bull while you're when you're at the gas station or whether you pick up five Skittles off the floor and throw them in your mouth, like write it down because you'll be amazed. And, and, and I think if you take a simple common sense approach and you go, OK, well, I noticed I had pizza four days this week. I think we all can understand that like things like pizza and fried food, they're not exactly the best for us, right? Like they're not uh, very, <laughs> they're, they're not helping us reach our goals in terms of being healthy humans. Mm-hmm. And so just start to just start to swap one of those out and then write down your next week. And if you made two or three switches during that week, you'll notice it. Put the week side by side look at them and and make those small incremental improvements. And, you know, again, not pushing any sort of particular quote unquote diet, you know, but if you start with common sense changes and you start by actually monitoring and, and going through what you're actually consuming, I think it gives you a really good starting point. So eliminate, you know, if you want to look for just two or three things off the top of my head that you can eliminate and feel uh, night and day better, fried food, soda, and then excessive amounts of cheese, right? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Um, you know, your pizzas fall into that category. Um, the calzones, that type of stuff, <laughs> yeah. like they're delicious. Don't get me wrong. Um, but the, but they're not helping us reach our goals. So just mm-hmm. look for those things and look for areas to improve. And if you, and if you take out something like, uh, instead of getting French fries, you get vegetables on the side with your, you know, with your meal when you're out, uh, on the road. Hey, 
that's that's a start. That's progress. And that's all you look for is you look for progress. And certainly, you know, if you have specific dietary needs, then you need to be contacting, you know, uh, a medical professional to make sure that, uh, you know, any diet changes don't affect you uh, adversely. So certainly check with uh, check with a doctor first. But, you know, use common sense as a starting point mm-hmm. and use self accountability as a starting point. It's great advice. And one thing I'll add to that writing stuff down, this is something I actually had to do. Um, just for my own personal knowledge was not only writing down what I was eating, but writing down how what I was eating was making me feel, right? Because oftentimes we don't know, like we're loaded up on caffeine or we're tired or we're not really exactly paying attention to what our body's telling us. So like if you eat a bunch of green vegetables, you're going to feel the difference immediately. You just will. Mm -hmm. Like you're getting all those vitamins, minerals, et cetera, into your body. So you do that, write that down. When you go have that calzone or that pizza filled with cheese and all these dairy products, write down how you feel afterwards. And the more clean your diet gets, the more you're going to get that instant feedback from your body, right? And so next is going to come down to what we talked about in our previous podcast, and that's habits. Trying to add in as much good as you can every single day is going to create that habit. In my life right now, there's no way I'm starting my day with breakfast with bacon and eggs there's no chance there's just no chance there's not gonna be any greasy food any processed food in my breakfast there's just no way the habits there it's solid same goes for lunchtime right so now it's dinner time it's after dinner time did i have a bag of chips last night with my wife yeah i did you know what i mean these things happen and um it's like the habit's not always there it's not about being perfect but if you can nail down breakfast lunch and just keep working at it keep adding those foods in the better you feel, the better you eat, the better you're going to want to feel, and the better you're going to want to eat. So my advice is also to just get started. I think a lot of people message me, I want to get started. I want to get started. I want to just get started. You know fruits and vegetables are good for you. You know processed food full of shit is not good for you. You know McDonald's is not good for you, right? These aren't, um, I didn't make this stuff up. We all know these things. A lot of these things we all know. We don't need someone to tell us, right, Kevin? We right. Don't need, I don't need Kevin to tell me not to go get a Big Mac after the game. I know this. But ironically, my hockey team back in the day would stop at McDonald's after every road game and get McDonald's, which is kind of strange, but it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. But if you if you want something practical that will completely change the way you feel and the way you eat, is log four simple things. Log what you eat, log how much water you consume, log how you feel at key points during the day, meaning when you wake up, do you feel groggy? Do you feel right? Like same thing in the afternoon, same thing in the evening and write how many hours you slept. For sure. Sleep's right a big there. one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you keep track of those things, you'll start to find patterns, right? This goes back to identifying that self-evaluation, identify the patterns that are happening in your life and then make improvements on them. hundred percent. I'm going to give one more pro tip that we're going to move on for this one. And this is something I literally had to do the last few years of my career Start being prepared, start taking care of yourself and start preparing your own food. If you really want to take it seriously, if you really want to feel better, you can't depend on other people to accommodate to you wanting to be a healthier individual. You just can't. The world doesn't do it. Your team's not going to do it. It's not their fault. It's not anybody's fault. But the team bus is not stopping at Whole Foods after the game. Let's just be real, right? They're going to stop at the most convenient, cheapest place to get 30 guys fed and 30 guys recovered. Like, But like... McDonald's compared to like a healthy um, stir fry is not going to recover you at the same rate. So let's be real. If you want to be serious, start prepping your own food. Start buying your own food. If you're 15, 16 years old and you got a couple bucks, you can say to mom and dad, hey, this processed stuff, it's great. Once in a while, it's fun. But it's about, I don't want to make up any numbers, but it's like the, the, the 80 20 rule or the 90 10 rule, right? Should you never have McDonald's? I think you should never have McDonald's. But if you have it 5 to 10% of your time and you used to have it 90% of your time, now we're getting somewhere, right? So it's all about getting that number to a more manageable place. Because some kid asked me the other day, well, is it all right to have McDonald's like once a week? Like, no, man. It's not. It's all right. If you want to, sure. Is it healthy? No. So it's always two different conversations. You can do whatever you want to do, right? You can drink. You can smoke. You can eat McDonald's. Great. But – it's not healthy. It's not helping you. It's not helping your career. So it all depends on where you want to take these things, right? And That's it. Um, just to get started, we'll get fresh fruits and vegetables. Kevin said, log your stuff, log your sleep, log how you feel, and you can go from there. So I'll take the next question here, Maddie. Uh, we got, I got, a, I get this question a lot. Uh, so it's one that I, it's actually good to kind of answer because a lot of people know me as, you know, a video guy. 
And that's very true. So the question came from Instagram said, what programs do you use to do video with your teams? And it's a really good, uh, it's a really good question because it's something that I think a lot of people struggle with. It's, it's little, a little bit of like that overwhelming, um, you know, question if you don't know where to get started, it's tough to get started. So for me personally, I use Exos Thunder and then I use Exos Thunder Cloud, which is the app version and the cloud version for um, our players to get remote access to their video. I will warn you, it is very expensive. It is not for the faint of heart. It's not, um, you know, it, it's not a it's not a ten dollar app that you buy and and just start, you know, you just start using. It's a, it's a significant investment. It's extremely powerful. It's designed for professional use. You know, when I say professional, I mean it integrates with a lot of the stuff that the NHL is doing. Um, you know, so it's it, it's not the most practical application for uh, your, your just your average guy who's coaching youth hockey. So um, when I get this question, I like to go through a lot of different options that are out there so coaches know at least where to start. So if you have an unlimited budget, I'm going to tell you in my own personal experience, hands down, I, I'm a big fan of Exos Thunder. So I would take a look at that. Their website's exosdigital.com. Um, Beyond that, if you're more of a Mac person, they there's uh, Sports Code, is a is another very popular one. Uh, some pro teams do use it still. I don't know to what extent because I know Exos I think is now at like 24, 25 NHL teams are on the Exos platform. Um, you know, Sport Codes again, it's not a cheap option, but it's certainly cheaper than um, than Exos. So, um, I would also say that if you want to go the um, if we're still staying in the paid realm, you also have Huddle, which was originally designed, I believe, for football, hence the name. Uh, they are more of a web interface for, for game tape, so it's it's more cloud-based. It's not one that I've spent a lot of time with, so I don't really have any, any opinion, good, bad, or, or indifferent on that. Uh, another newer emerging one is Crossover with a K, K-R-O-S-S-O-V-E-R. Um, that is one that is actually kind of new and it's very interesting because they will actually do a lot of the work for you. If you so choose, you can submit the games and they will tag them for you, meaning tagging events, uh, marking goals, marking power plays, penalty kills, whatever you ask them to do, um, they will tag and it's, it's fairly quick turnaround. So if you're a guy who's pressed for time, it's an interesting concept, but again, obviously that service is not free. If you're looking for a simple way to share your videos with your, with your players and, and, you know, maybe other coaches, then I'm going to recommend the simple is easy. Go with a private video on YouTube, mm -hmm. right? Get a Vimeo account and upload it. Uh, you could do that. You can make just simple notes. Like don't overthink this, grab a piece of notebook paper, watch your video. When you see something happen, write down the time, the time code on the bottom, write, write it down, write down what happened. And then you've kind of got reference to it. And really that's, that's the basic that's that's what's happening in the background of any of these advanced softwares, right? An Exos Thunder. If I hit, um, you know, if I hit S, I know that it's marking a shot on that game tape. Does it make it easier for me to go back and retrieve it and sort it and use it and build other clips? Of course it does. But you know, if you're just getting started, the free options YouTube or, um, you know, I, I don't know if Vimeo has a free version anymore, but you know, their their basic um, paid subscription I think is somewhere around fifty bucks a year, sixty bucks a year. Somewhere between somewhere in that price range. So we're not talking about a lot, especially if you're divvying it over, you know, call it 20 players. You're asking them to kick in a couple bucks each to to purchase a license for something that, you know, in theory, then you can you can email out the link, the private link to your video and every single one of your players can watch that video. And heck, you can even put in the descriptions, you can put the time codes of whatever you wrote down. Right. So that those players can at least see them and skip to them. So there's a lot of options out there. Um you know, I don't know, Matty, do you? you no, I think um, I think this is why this podcast is fantastic because Kevin can really give you that um, really deep elite level video options and other options. And I can give you kind of a little more basic um, stuff that I've used because I'm not really at that level at the moment. So a few of the things that I've used, I've used an app called Coach's Eye. I'm not sure if you've ever used that one, but that was yep. it was pretty affordable. And that just gives you kind of the option of recording your player, slowing it down, adding some lines, adding some angles, stuff like that, giving him that instant feedback that you're looking for. I didn't use it a ton, so that's kind of what I did use it for, and I found it to be quite helpful. You could email those clips to people. You can add voice recordings to them. So Coach's Eye was a helpful one. And something that I even did last week, I even sent the video to Kevin, was 
I just recorded the kid. I went into my editing software. I use a program called ScreenFlow. You can use iMovie. You can use whatever. And I just put a few different clips together of our training session, and I added some voiceover after the fact, right? I slowed the clips down, put them into slow-mo, and I just talked and um, I just talked through what I was seeing, what I was kind of experiencing while he was doing the drill. And I find that to be extremely helpful just because when you're on the ice with a kid working, if you're, especially if you're working with a bunch of kids, it's hard to break them all down individually and give them that instant error correction that every kid needs. And even sometimes you miss it, right? So I found that to be helpful. And just like Kevin said, that's another simple way of doing it. Just a simple clip, add some voiceover, give him two or three takeaways. So when he comes back to the rink the following day or the following week, he can watch those clips and say, okay, now I know what to do. Now I can make those adjustments. And now you don't have to waste time making those adjustments on the ice, right? And I think time is one thing we're trying to save, especially when it comes to ice and ice costs. If you can kind of go over those little simple tweaks, simple um, systems. Systems are also a good thing to go through on video or just before practice, whatever it may be, just to make sure that players are all on the same page, we're ready to go. You can hit the ice. You can say, hey, remember we talked about in the video? The kid can say, yeah. Bang, you get right after it. So a couple really good advanced um, ideas there from Kevin, a couple basic ones from me. Everything works. It depends where you're at, where your career's at, where your coaching level's at, and uh, how far you want to take it. Yeah, and you kind of hit on um, sort of the other side of the video thing there too with uh, w- with Coach's Eye, and you hit more into the motion analysis, which is really kind of what um, that particular app, that, that's what the wheelhouse of that app is. Um, so I guess just real quick, I'll go through a few options for everybody, um, in terms of sort of good setups for the motion analysis side of it. Coach's eye is a good one. Huddle technique is a good one, not to be confused with huddle that, um, you know, we just, uh, we, we just mentioned in the team portion because huddle is designed more for the team stuff. Huddle technique is more motion analysis. And by the way, that's spelled H U D L, um, dart fish has a good option, Um, that's another solid one. They have some interesting tweaks in it where you can actually add still frames, um, so that when you share the video, they can actually skip right to those still frames and you can mark it up, put text on whatever you want. So it's, it's got a couple interesting tweaks. And then there's a new one called coach cast by double blue sports. Um, they're, they're making some really interesting improvements to it. Uh, I I think that's going to be, um, I think that's going to be a real contender here in the next couple of years. I I've, I've used it a few times, uh, for me personally right now we're we're actually kicking around a few different options we uh we're we're lucky here in the in the pittsburgh area where uh where the penguins have been so kind to uh, get us some brand new ipad pros so that we film everything in slow motion which is just 240 frames per second so even if you're working on shot you get good detail of what's happening with the stick with the skate you name it um but we're we're bound we're bouncing back and forth right now between whether or not we're going to use huddle technique or um, dart fish. So we're, we're just kind of weighing the pros and cons of both and what's going to serve us best to uh, to log a, a large number of athletes because we're not only working with the pros, we're working with the, the AAA program and the rink programming, you know, camps that we do. So um, we've got a lot of footage to sift through. Yeah, so test a few of these things out, see what works best for you. I know some of these programs, I've tried them as well. Some are hard for me to get my hands on. Some it's like it's almost too much work for what I want to try to do. So not everything fits for everybody, right? So make sure you find one that fits perfectly for you and just start start tweaking these things, right? Because it takes some getting used to um, for a lot of coaches who maybe aren't technically as savvy as some other ones. So test them out, yep. find something that works, and um, yeah, use video to your advantage as much as possible. Nice. So the second question that we got from Instagram or I got from Instagram, uh, was really along the same vein. It said, how often should I be going through video with my Bantam team? And this is, a, this is another question that I get a lot and, you know, you can replace Bantam with whatever level that the, the person's coaching. And my answer is really simple. It's, it's a, what, how much video do you have time to prepare and B, how much video can you get your team to actually, um, pay attention to? Right. So you have to understand at the Bantam group, if you're talking about an elite, an elite level team, I would say at least once a week. Um, I, I, you know, most of these Bantam teams are playing um, playing games on the weekend, at least two games on the weekend. So you should have fresh footage all the time. And I think keeping it fresh like that is is good. It allows you to go through it and kind of stay fresh on the mind if you hit it, you know, if you have practice on Wednesday. So I would say minimum of once a week, if you're really good and you're, you know, you're on the road and you're proficient in video, then heck, 
throw in a video se- uh, video session or two on the road. I mean, there's nothing wrong with getting in the hotel room, huddling up around the TV and, you know, plug in the iPad or whatever your camera or, you know, your Exos Thunder setup or whatever you may have into the hotel TV and, you know, going through a few key points before the game. So I think it boils down to A, what are you comfortable with and B, you know, what makes sense for your team and, and what's the attention span. I think those are some great points. And as you mentioned those, I just think from a, a player's perspective, I'm just thinking back to all the coaches that I've had and uh, kind of the different video video sessions they would put us through. And, and I'll say sometimes less is more when it comes to video as a coach. And like Kevin said, depending on your group, if you have a very technical group and you have a group that wants to sit there and get better and they get better through video, then great. But if you have a group, like I've had a few groups where as soon as that video goes on, you just see the guy's eyes just go. Mm-hmm. And they're not even looking, right? So I think once a week for sure, I think a couple clips before a game is is it's helpful for me to point out a few errors and stuff like that. But I've also had coaches who would break stuff down in between periods and kind of call guys out. And that it doesn't always go over so well with every single player, right? So if you have a player that you know is going to be more sensitive to being called out than the next guy, I would maybe avoid doing it during a game, before a game, because I think confidence is sometimes people don't have a whole lot of it. You, you got to have a feel of a, as a coach as to what needs to be done, what needs to be said and who it needs to be said towards. I've seen guys get torn to shreds during video and just, it was game over for them, right? They get torn to shreds on Friday, their weekend shot because you know what I mean? People don't like being called out in front of a group. Let's face it, right? Nobody does. And so you got to find a way to do that. And sometimes guys do have to be called out. Let's, let's, let's not be too soft here, but Find a way to do that where you're actually using the video as a teaching tool and just using that player as a specific example and not exactly saying, hey, man, what the what are you doing here, right? And I've had coaches do that. like, And you, you just sit there like, I don't know. Like sometimes you just don't know. <laughs> we all make mistakes, right? So I think video for a guy like me, very useful. It's, it's very easy for me to see the areas I'm making, especially positionally and stuff like that. So as not really a guy who's coaching a team at the moment, it's hard for me to say how many times a week to do it. So I'm just kind of giving you some feedback from a player's perspective. Um, if you overdo it, you're going to lose people. You're, you're just going to mm-hmm. lose the players. And by the time that video comes out, guys are going to be rolling their eyes and they're just not going to be paying attention. But if it's like a once a week, 30 minutes, you know what you're doing. It's video time. It's all set up. It's prepared. I've also had a coach. I'm not going to name names. But every time the video came out, there was a problem. You'd have 20 clips lined up. None of the clips would work. And so make sure, just like when you're doing a good podcast, your technical stuff is ready to go, and it's going to work. Because you lose guys in the first five minutes of that video session, good luck. You want it to be as effective as possible. Let's just wrap up a long way of saying efficient as possible, effective as possible. Simple tweaks here and there are going to probably be best for most talkie guys. Yep, and and again, if you're you're tech-savvy, and you don't have a setup where you can actually do video at the rink with your team on a consistent basis, make a five minute clip, upload it to YouTube, private URL, text or email it to all your players, ask them to watch before practice, have a five minute discussion about the video, you know, where you can ask some questions, get them involved, right? Be creative on it. You don't have to like, it doesn't have to be a professional setup every time. You don't have to be in a professional, you know, video room with a, with a 900 inch television on the wall or a projector or anything like that. I mean, I can tell you I've done video sessions in hotels with, uh, you know, they're probably 27 inch TVs. It's tiny, right? It looked like we were huddled around an iPad basically, but, um, be creative, find ways to deliver the content to your team. Yeah. Yeah. Find a way to make it happen and just like we said before, use that video to your advantage. I think it's very um, effective tool, right? Especially for a lot of guys that have a hard time. You know when you're going through a drill in practice and it's like um, you're trying to work on a breakout or a power play. A lot of I shouldn't say a lot of guys, but some players can't grasp those concepts in the moment when it's going super fast. But broken down, seeing it on screen can be very helpful for certain players. And always just remember that everybody kind of learns in a different way, right? Not everybody learns on the fly. Not everybody learns looking at a playbook. And so use these different techniques to uh, try to get the most out of every single player. Love it. Yeah. Maddie, I'm throwing you a curveball with this next question. Do this it. is a fun one. <laughs> My son's coach doesn't want parents watching practices. What gives? Hmm. <laughs> was, was this uh, age group specific? 
Um, it didn't, no reference to it, yeah. but, uh, mm, I know I have one. my opinions on it. It's, this is a fun one that's for me. One. So, cause I certainly have an opinion and if, you know what, I'll take you off the hot seat for a second and I'll say this, I go, this is what I always tell parents. I have no problem watching, but you can't be involved at, at no point in your work day. Do you have somebody standing on the glass to your office with your, their nose pressed against it, just staring at you? It makes for a really uncomfortable environment, not only for <laughs> yeah. you as a professional, meaning the coach on the ice, but also for the players, right? Especially like, you know, if I saw my dad with his nose pressed against the glass and just, I mean, it, it, it's, it's an odd vibe. So mm -hmm. I think my guess would be it's rooted in that. It's yeah. rooted in, you have a little bit of space. You're trusting that coach to do his job. It's a lot easier to do that job if he's not second guessing every word he's saying, if he's not looking over his shoulder, wondering why he's got five parents standing on the corner of the glass, all with their arms crossed. Right. So I, I think respect that. Uh, I don't think most coaches don't have an issue with watching practice if you're passively watching um, where where the issues in my experience tend to come in is when um you have your nose pressed against the glass. You're trying to communicate with your kid, right? Like you see this a lot with goalie parents where, <sighs> you know, the a goal goes in and the first place, first place the goalie's eyes go right up to the stands. You're mm -hmm. just, you know, you, you, you want to tear your hair out with that because it's just counterproductive. And then, you know, three seconds after the coach is off the ice, you're asking him questions about why this guy was playing on with this guy on a two-on-one drill. And you're going, I don't even remember that. Like maybe it happened, maybe it didn't, you know. Um, so I think that to me, that's probably the root of it. So if you're just there passively watching and just let the coach do his job. I think you make a great point with that, um, the office reference, right? And my, my first question for the coach is going to be why, right? That's, that's always what I want to know. Why? You don't want me here. I just want to know. I would just want to know as a parent why, right? And if you had a reasonable answer, like the one you just gave, I think I could respect that. I think if there was a lot of parents getting involved and disrupting the flow of practice and that's no good for anybody, right? And you know, as a skills coach, when you're there, I know this feelings. I've had this all the time when it's you and a couple of players, or just you one on one. There's like three random dudes in the seats, and you're just like, who are those guys? And it's, it's affecting how you do things on the ice because now you feel a little bit more uncomfortable. You feel like they're judging you. You feel like they're watching you. You're trying to like justify everything in your mind why you're doing certain things. At least I feel that way, especially when I I have examples of like myself filming videos. If it's just me filming the videos, I have that rink to myself. I'm going to be a much different person than if it's me and then like 10 people in the crowd just like weirdly watching me, right? So I get where he's coming from there. And sometimes I've been there where you're trying to run a drill and the dad's over the glass telling the kid to pay attention and you're telling the kid to pay attention. Now the kid doesn't know who to listen to and the dad's like in his boots on the – it's just like, come on, man. If you're going to trust a coach to have your kid up as a part of the team, then you got to trust the coach to do his job, Right. And if he's not doing his job, then take the five minutes after practice, have a professional conversation with him, voice your opinions, and then move on from there. But like I've talked about before, ice time's expensive, practice time is valuable. And um, like Kevin said, if you're going to passively watch, fine. But if you're going to be a problem, then I can see where that coach is coming from. At first, I thought it was kind of ridiculous, but if you think more about it and he's got the right intentions, I think he's got a pretty um, a decent point there. Yeah. And I'll take it from the, cause you hit on the skills coach thing, mm -hmm. which is a little bit different dynamic than a team. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I think anytime you're doing a private or small group lesson, I think as a skills coach, you're, you accept the fact that you're going to have people around. Does it maybe make it less comfortable? Of course. But at the same time, it's also some built in accountability. And, you know, I, I'm fortunate enough to work at an NHL practice facility and you know, I can tell you that when we're on the main rink there, it, the whole thing's a fishbowl. It's designed to be a fishbowl, right? Like, I mean, there's people that come and tour the facility. There's, you, you name it, there's offices, there's workout facilities, and they all overlook the rinks. So, you know, you, you also have to accept that that's a little bit part of your, part of your job and part of what's going to happen while you're doing your job. So, yeah. you know, get comfortable. In, and certainly when you're just getting started, it's not comfortable at all, you know, um, but just kind of accept that it's a, it's a hazard of the job, so to speak. And, you know, if you know, if you're out there and you know, you're doing a good job and you know, you're engaged and, and, and involved in the, in the teaching elements of it, then, then don't worry about it. That's one of the top tips. My first ever skating coach told me, she says, you're at a job where people can watch you for free whenever they want, right close. They can make notes, they can judge you. So be ready, be prepared. Right. And so as a coach, that was one thing I took I took to heart and I was always trying to be as prepared as I could 
we're getting a little off topic, but bring as much energy as I could, be as focused and um, in the zone as I could because the person who's paying you to do the job is now watching you, right? Like you said, that's very, uh, it's maybe not that rare, but like to be watching you that closely, um, you can't go back to them and say, well, it wasn't, uh, it was a great practice when it wasn't because they know they were watching yeah. you. So I always used to use that as kind of motivation, right? I always say, well, there's the parents, there's the person paying me, there's whatever. You pretend someone else is watching, just like kids who say, how do I get noticed by a scout? We always pretend there's a scout there. Always play like there's a scout there. That's what I used to do. Tell yourself there's a scout there. Tell yourself it's time to show up, do your job. Because when you leave there and there's 30 people watching practice and you've done a good job, that's a good feeling, right? So use that as motivation. We're a little off topic, but use the people watching as motivation to do your job well and realize that you are being critiqued, that people are critiquing you all day long, every single day, no matter what you're doing. So be prepared, be professional, and do a good job. Yep. Love it. The next one uh, goes back into sort of the development side of things. And it says, what is the best way to work on my stride off the ice? Hmm. So, Maddie, I'll let you kick this one off. Lots of ways to do that. I think um, I just I got a video today I'm going to share wearing these. I got some new rollerblades are called Mars Blades. It's actually one of the closest rollerblades um, that has the feel of an actual ice skate. For whatever reason, I'm not going to get into the technical side of things, but I remember as a kid, my dad would tell me, your stride is too short. Get out there in the summer and work on your stride. Find a hill, find something, and just work on lengthening that stride. Once again, it goes back to learning what a stride looks like, learning what a proper stride feels like. And if you can maybe get someone to help you do that, um, that's going to help you get the feel of what it's supposed to look like and feel like when you're out there practicing that. So you can just get out there and hold, just add a couple extra inches to that stride every single time if you have rollerblades. I think I shared this example before of doing like towel strides where you put the stride, the your feet on the towels and you're making full extensions, getting the feel like that. You can also just stand there, get in that hockey stance and make strides, stride steps and just step out, come back underneath, step out, back underneath. So it's about learning some drills, using YouTube to your advantage and just working on these things. Yep. And you hit it with you have to understand what a stride looks like before you go, right? So it's if you're really unclear about what a good stride looks like, go on YouTube. There's a ton of videos on stride, right? And, and a lot of there's actually a lot of really good ones broken down. I mean, you can look for you know some of the skating professionals that are out there. there. There's almost all of them now have a YouTube channel, right? Like if you want to find out how I teach a stride, there's a video probably from at this point it's probably about eight years old, I think. But uh, but the videos up there. If you want to find out how Laura Stam teaches it, she's got videos out there. Um, so so take a look first. But one that one thing that I want to actually tackle on this has very little to do with actually how the stride looks is I think a lot of people's strides are bad, quote unquote bad, because of immobility in the joints. Um, so, you know, a, a good stride engages a lot of body parts, right? It, it involves a lot. So if your hips are tight, if your groin's tight, if your knees are tight, if your ankles are tight, you are going to struggle to execute a full extension on a stride. So make sure your mobility is set. If you don't know what to do for mo uh, mobility for that, um, beyond stretching, look up myofascial release and find some, find some areas to improve. I mean, you can, you trust me, the hip mobility range for hockey players is usually, you know, suspect because we overwork, everybody's dominant one side. So you get imbalances that, that form and you get lack of flexibility, um, in, in certain areas. So take a look into that first and, and really make sure that you're physically ready to then transition whatever work you do off ice to the, on, to the on ice portion of it. Sure. One, one quick practical tip is just work on getting lower, work on sitting lower, work on getting those hips pushed back and, you can stand up nice and tall and then try to step your leg back and see how far it goes and then get down to that nice low hockey position and then see how far, how much reach you can get with that leg and really start to understand what um, a proper setup looks like, how those joints are supposed to be stacked up and just see where that body takes you. Start learning more about your body, start seeing how it feels and you'll get there, work on it slowly but surely, you'll figure out what it feels like, what it looks like. I'm still trying to figure it all out myself. There's so much that goes into a nice, perfect stride that uh, the learning process really never ends. So that would be a good place to start and then just keep chipping away at it. Yep, absolutely. Maddie, you have any more questions? Because that officially empties the, uh, yeah, for sure. the I, list on my end. I think, yeah, so the last question we had was, how should I work on my speed when I live in Georgia and I'm not privileged enough to skate every single day? So I think a lot of the tips we've thrown out here throughout this podcast are going to be useful for you. 
work on that stride length, work on that leg strength. If you have access to a gym or a trainer, you can start trying to build that strength in your legs, build up that core strength. Being stronger is going to make you skate faster. Let's not kid ourselves, right? That's one simple thing you can do. Body weight squats, body weight lunges. If you can add some weights to that, whatever it may be, find a trainer, do these things properly, yada, yada, yada. Um, so those are things you can do. Like I think Kevin talked about this in a previous episode. Go to the park and do sprints. Sprints are going to help you get faster and they're 100% free, right? Everybody can do them. All you need is some space and a good attitude. So... Those things are going to work, man. They're just little tiny things, but you will notice a difference going into the season if you do those things consistently. Yep. This all boils down to consistency, right? Everything we do, habits, whether we're talking about nutrition, whether we're talking about video, whether we're talking about off-ice training, it doesn't matter. It, this this game and being successful in this game boils down to what habits are we going to bring to the table? What habits are we going to bring to the rink and the gym day in, day out? Mm-hmm. Well, along with habits goes that attitude, right? If you're going to show up it's not going to be a good attitude every single day, but if you can get yourself in that work attitude every single day and work no matter what you feel like and bring that consistency no matter how you feel, it's going to make a huge difference as well. So I think a lot of these guys are maybe adding these things to their game once in a while, not seeing results, getting frustrated. But like Kevin said, it's a consistency game. you got to just keep working on consistency just like you got to keep working on your skills, right? So challenge yourself to show up every single day. If you take a day off, that's fine. If you get down for a day, that's fine. But just challenge yourself to show up, be the best you can be every day. And hopefully these little tips helped you guys a little bit. Um, The more of these things you can add, the better you're going to be, the better you're going to feel, especially when it comes to the health and nutrition stuff. So get after it. Um, I think we might wrap it up right there, Kevin, unless you got any other questions for me. Nope, it's a good place to wrap it up. So again, it's Matt Corthius. You can find him online, social media, at Hockey Pro Training. I'm Kevin Muller. You can find me online at Kevin M2 Hockey. And you can submit questions for the Q&A portions of all our podcasts at hockeyshare.com slash questions. And that wraps us up for episode five. Thanks, Matty. Thanks, buddy. We'll see you guys next week.